This is Duke University. You guys ready? Welcome, everyone. Oh, that's loud. Um, welcome to our latest installment of the Federalist Society's Lunch and Debate Series. Uh, today we have Professor Neil Siegel, who needs no introduction. You all have seen him speak before, I'm sure. And Clark Neely from the Institute for Justice. Clark joined the Institute for Justice as a senior attorney in 2000, and he litigates economic liberty, property rights, school choice, First Amendment, and other constitutional cases in both federal and state courts. I apologize for the late delay. Our barbecue delivery system is a little more antiquated than our Chick-fil-A delivery system. We'll work on it. With that, I'll turn it over to Clark. Thanks. <clears throat> well, thanks for having me, uh, and thanks for coming. I understand from Professor Siegel there were some competing events, so glad you chose this one. I won't ask you whether it was because of the food or the speakers. Um, I always forget to do this uh, at the end, so I'm going to do it at the beginning and make a plug for public interest law. Um, I've been doing it for 12 years almost. I started off in private practice, and it's, it's, it's just great. Um, the, I heard a, somebody say one time the only three jobs worth having are rock star, movie star, and fighter pilot. Um, I don't have the eyes to be a pilot, and I think it's going to be pretty evident in a minute why I couldn't have the other two jobs. Um, but, but being a public interest lawyer is just unbelievably fulfilling. Um, I get up every morning, I put on my steel tip work boots, and I go look for a bureaucrat to kick, and life just doesn't get better. I mean, if you've never sued a bureaucrat, you owe it to yourself uh, <laughs> to give it a try. Anyway, um, so I work for an organization called the Institute for Justice. We are the nation's only libertarian public interest law firm. Um, by the way, that's libertarian with a small l, ideological, not with a capital L, kooky political. Um, we just have a view that essentially the Constitution protects a, a wide range of liberty and that it imposes significant limits on government power and we look for cases that enable us to make that kind of precedent. Um, and if you're interested um, in the Institute for Justice specifically, we do have summer clerkships. They're usually 1Ls um, because they're not paid, but uh, I understand that most people are generally successful in getting some kind of a fellowship. Uh, and we also have a kind of a two and a half day public interest boot camp in June called our Law Student Conference. And so if you can't be with us for a whole summer, but you're interested enough, um, by all means, take a look. The information for that is online. Uh, our website is ij.org. So that's the pitch. All right. So I'm here today to talk about a concept called judicial engagement. Um, judicial engagement is a term that we coined um, near the beginning of the year that I think is often misunderstood, which is fine. It's a new term. But it's not a new concept. Judicial engagement really means nothing more than honest, sincere judging. And you might ask yourself, why would we need to create a special term to describe this? And the answer is because in constitutional law, and this is going to be the thesis of my talk today, there is a tremendous amount of disingenuous, insincere judging. I call it judicial abdication, or sometimes make-believe judging. And I hope to astonish you today with the amount of it and how brazen it is. In other words, there are just a tremendous number of cases in which when a citizen goes into court to try to vindicate a particular right or enforce a particular limit on government power, they do not encounter anything remotely describable as judging. And what they get instead is merely the simulacra of judicial review. And I think this is intolerable. So I want to state that very clearly at the beginning because I don't want to you know, sort of get bogged down in fighting any straw men. Um, reasonable people can absolutely dis uh, disagree. And they do and should disagree about what the Constitution means and how it should apply in any given setting. What I don't think reasonable people should disagree about is that in any given constitutional setting, you as a citizen should be entitled to real, sincere judging and not make-believe judging, um, which is what you're going to get, unfortunately, in many constitutional cases. All right. Um, let's do a little exercise real quick just to, so I can illustrate to you what I mean um, when, I, when I make a distinction between real judging and make-believe judging. Um, and you're right there in the front row, so I'm going to ask you if you don't mind. Um, what's your name? Dean say, say your first name again. Dean. Dean. Okay. Dean, do you live, do you live here? I do. Okay. So, uh, and, and, and here is Chapel Hill? No. Close to Chapel What? Durham. Durham, right. I was in Chapel Hill yesterday. My bad. I know there's some sensitivity about that issue around here. Anyway. Okay. So you're in Durham. If, um, if the city of Durham passed a law that said that you cannot leave your house, apartment, condo, I don't know probably right. Yeah. Uh, without permission from the mayor, do you think that law would be constitutional or unconstitutional? 
unconstitutional. Is that what you said? Yes. Actually, even as a kind of a foaming at the mouth libertarian constitutional litigator, I actually don't think you can answer that question without asking why that law was enacted. So for example, if you had just returned from a scientific um, expedition in Africa where you were hanging out with monkeys and you were hemorrhaging blood from your eyes and your nose, uh, anybody know what he's got? Yeah, he's got, he's got hemorrhagic Ebola fever probably. Um, and if the law says he has to stay in his apartment, right, until you can get medical care or be quarantined or something, I think that starts to look pretty reasonable, right? Uh, at least you can make a pretty good case for it. I, I certainly would prefer that you stay in your apartment. Um, okay. What if instead Dean is known to be the most eloquent political speaker of his generation, which is probably true, right? I can already sort of get that vibe. Uh, and an election is coming up, and it's known that he opposes the mayor. And it's also known that he does a lot of street corner speaking, and he's very persuasive when he does it. And then this law is passed. Are we a little suspicious? I mean, if the government comes into court and says, well, listen, you've got to understand, uh, uh, Dean might have been at the zoo. Have you been to a zoo? Not at the zoo. Okay, ever? Uh, when I was a kid, yeah. Okay, were there monkeys there? Yes. Oh, okay, well, perhaps you have Ebola. <laughs> No, I mean, you laugh, but that's rational basis review. Believe it or not, that's rational basis review. This guy went to a zoo one time where there were monkeys. He might have Ebola. It's conceivable. I mean, we don't have any evidence that he does, but it's great. We don't need any. It's rational basis review. And so we're just not taking any chances. Now, here's the distinction. In both settings, I think it is impossible to rule on the constitutionality of this law without asking a very fundamental question, and that is, what's really going on? Right? And here's the interesting point. Sometimes courts ask this question and make a sincere attempt to learn the answer. And other times, they do not. And that's the distinction I'm after. I'm not even here to talk to you really about tiered standards review and whether there should be higher or lower scrutiny. What I'm here to talk to you about is a, is a category of cases in which courts don't even bother to make the inquiry that we just went through. And that's the problem I'm talking about, where the courts essentially just say, we are going to bend over backwards. We are going to stick our heads however deep we have to into a hole to ignore what's really going on if there's a conceivable, totally disingenuous and insincere, but conceivable justification. And I litigate rational basis cases, so I'm pretty familiar with that style of judging. It's not judging. Uh, rubber stamping, make-believe judging. Um, and it happens. And it happens all the time. And it shouldn't. There shouldn't be any room, in my opinion, for make-believe judging in this case. And I want to go through some specific examples with you to try to underscore how important it is for judges to engage in real judging and what a disgrace it is and how unjust it is when they don't. Um, OK. So let's start with a couple of constitutional rights that have somewhat ambiguous status. Um, the first one is marrying outside of your race. This one's near and dear to my heart. I just took advantage of it about seven months ago. Seriously, I did, in February. OK. <laughs> Um, does anybody know what the Supreme Court said the first time that came before it and, and somebody basically challenged uh, a state's ability to put them in jail for marrying outside of the race? They said no constitutional right, or at least no meaningful constitutional right, uh, Pace v. Alabama, 1883. And then the Supreme Court changed its mind and got it right, I would say, probably hopefully everybody in the room would say. In what case? Loving v. Virginia. Very good. Wow, I'm impressed. Okay, 1967. So it took them about 80 years to finally get it right, but they got it right. Okay. Uh, what about uh, the forced sterilization of allegedly dim-witted women who are also supposedly promiscuous? Call it the Jersey Shore Doctrine. <laughs> constitutional or unconstitutional? Well, it depends when you ask. Again, in Buck v. Bell in 1927, the Supreme Court said, totally fine, none of our business. If you want to sterilize people and, you know, for eugenic purposes, that's fine. Does anybody know the famous line from Buck v. Bell from Oliver Wendell Holmes? Three generations of imbeciles are enough. I personally feel that three generations of status are enough, but I'm libertarian. Um, and then it, it turned around and got the question right in, in Skinner v. Oklahoma um, about, fifth, I think it was 15 years later in 1942, and they said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. There is a, a, not only is there a right to be not forcibly sterilized, it's a fundamental right. And what does that mean when the court wakes up and says something is a fundamental right? Well, basically it means what, that they're going to do the first kind of inquiry that we went through with Dean. What's really going on here? So if the, if the government comes in and says, well, look, uh, you know, basically this woman is demonstrably mentally retarded, and she's, for whatever reason, um, promiscuous, and she has physical problems that will kill her if she gets pregnant, well, you might be able to make a compelling case that either you're going to have to put her essentially in protective custody, put her in jail for the rest of her life, or sterilize her. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. But what you don't do, uh, or what the courts will not permit you to do, is come in and assert that 
when in fact your true purpose is eugenic, as it was through much of the early 20th century. They are going to ask what's really going on, and they are going to require evidence if you say that, for example, uh, a woman is, is going to die if she gets pregnant because of some physical problem that she has, they will actually require you to prove that. Okay. So let's talk about uh, one other thing, and then we'll do some real cases that I've been involved in. Um, what about having your children taken away from you by the government and forced into what amounts to a government-run indoctrination center? Is that a right you have to, to not have that happen to you or, or not? Well, in the Pierce case, uh, 1925, I believe, uh, the Supreme Court, yeah, 1925, the Supreme Court said you do have that right, and it's a fundamental right. Does anybody know what was going on in Pierce? Oregon had made it a, a, a basically had forbidden private schools. It was a crime to enroll your child in a non-public school. Does anybody know what was really going on in Pierce? And this is really key because this is the difference between the court accepting something at face value and trying to see what's really going on. Yes, sir. What was going on? It was. It was. Because in, in the 1920s, and in fact for most of up until that point, um, and really not through the 1960s, public schools in America, believe it or not, were avowedly Protestant. They taught reading out of a Protestant Bible. And this was a big problem for Catholic families who weren't down with that. Um, do you know what organization was behind the, uh, the legislation in Oregon to eliminate private schools and force all children, including Catholic children, into Protestant public schools? It starts with a K. Ends with a K. <laughs> the middle initial is K. <laughs> it was a KKK. And so uh, this is the difference, essentially, between the courts accepting at face value the ridiculous arguments. Um, I almost use an anatomical term combined with a, with a, a mammalian term, but I won't. I had a law professor who used to make up all different kinds. It was bat one day and ape another day and bull another day. But anyway, so it's ridiculous. Um, but to the Supreme Court's credit, it didn't stop with the asserted justifications that the state of Oregon was offering, the completely insincere and disingenuous uh, explanations, and instead looked behind the stated explanations for what was really going on. And what was really going on was anti-Catholic indoctrination. All right. Let's take a right that's near and dear to my heart, because I spend most of my time litigating it, the right to earn a living. Fundamental or not fundamental? According to the Supreme Court. Well, no, let's not talk about the Supreme Court. What about you? How do you feel about your right to earn a living? Pretty important, right? I think so. I actually forgot to vote in the last presidential election because uh, I was on the road doing one of these events and I forgot to get an absentee ballot. Do you know how much that bothered me? Not at all. Not at all. But being told I can't earn a living in a particular job would bother me a great deal. I actually think that nothing that you do in your life, other than maybe who you marry and whether you have kids, more shapes who you are as a person than what you do for a living. And it's historical, too. I mean, look, you look back in common law, uh, and uh, there was a huge, there's a huge tradition in England of not allowing arbitrary what they called monopolies on particular abilities to earn a living. Um, you can even find it in the Bible. is a very eloquent passage um, in the Old Testament where God says to Adam, in the sweat of thy brow shall thou eat thy bread. Um, and even the Supreme Court says that you have a right to earn a living in the occupation of your choice. But they went from meaning it to not meaning it. How did they do that? Well, they, took, they didn't really have a clear standard of review um, sort of during the so-called Lochner era, which was a great era, um, it turns out. Um, but they relegated the right to earn a living to rational basis status. And that's a problem, because when you relegate a right to rational basis status, you move it from fundamental to non-fundamental, or as a constitutional litigator might, like me might describe it, meaningful to meaningless. A, meaningless. a meaningful right is one you actually have a prayer of vindicating in court. A meaningless right is one you don't. And any right protected by the rational basis test is, by definition, meaningless, because the rational basis test is a ridiculous fraud. It is not judging, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, let's take one of the earliest right to earn living cases. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, are any of the women in this room hoping to practice law one day? <laughs> Did you know that you, that was illegal, or that you couldn't do it? You do? Do you remember what case it was? Uh, Very good. Wow, you guys are amazing. All right. Take back every bad thing I said to my coworker who went to Duke about Duke Law School. <laughs> no, it's a friendly rival here. Um, OK, yes, Bradwell v. Illinois, 1873. Supreme Court said um, that a law prohibiting women from being members of the Illinois bar, totally OK. OK, well, this is a great example of the difference between taking a serious look and not taking a serious look. Um, and by the way, I mean, you know, they didn't make an equal protection argument in that case. There really wasn't, there wasn't any concept that women had an equal protection right. It was a straight up, I have a right to earn a living as a lawyer. And in fact, she was from Vermont where she was a lawyer. They admitted her to the bar. And imagine if the government came in and said, well, you know, here's the thing. Um, men have more testosterone, true. Um, men tend to be bigger risk takers, also true. And that just makes them better lawyers. And so women just don't have any business in the bar. 
You could have a court just totally take that at face value, rubber stamp it, which is essentially what the Supreme Court did in Bradwell. Or you could have the court actually look at it and say, well, wait a minute. First of all, are those things true? Maybe yes, maybe no. But does that really mean that men are better suited to be lawyers? Let's have an actual engaged judge here asking these questions, trying to determine what's really going on and what is really going on in that case. I mean, it's just men trying to keep women out of the same occupation so they don't have to compete with them. It's, I mean, you'd have to be an infant not to see that. All right, so very quickly, um, one more example case, uh, or one more uh, Supreme Court case, and then I'll give you two examples of cases that I've worked on. Um, does anybody know about the Yik Wo case? This is a case out of San Francisco that said that if you have a wooden laundry, you have to get a special permit from the city of San Francisco to operate it. If you have a stone or a brick laundry, you don't need a permit. Ostensibly, health and safety grounds. Wooden laundry is more likely to burn up. That law was struck down. Does anybody know why? Yeah. Once again, the Supreme Court looked behind the stated justification of the law, engaged with the case, refused to engage in the kind of insincere, fraudulent judging that is, would be rational basis review, and said, well, wait a minute, what's really going on here? And when they looked, what they found out was about 90 to 95% of the laundries in San Francisco were, in fact, constructed out of wood, so most of the people had to get this exemption, and everybody who applied for an exemption and was Chinese was denied, and virtually everybody who applied for an exemption and was white was granted. Straight up racial discrimination, but hidden beneath a layer of disingenuous public health and safety arguments. Now, let's move into the modern era. Two cases out of Louisiana. I litigated one myself. I helped on the other one. Two Louisiana occupational licensing laws, two different results in court. One judge engaged, the other judge abdicating. Also, both, by the way, purporting to apply rational basis review. I won't get into whether they really were or not. First case, Louisiana florists. You actually have to have a license in the state of Louisiana to, to sell floral arrangements. Take a bunch of flowers, put them together in an aesthetically pleasing way, try to sell that. You can't do it without a license. Is it any mystery why that law was on the books? Does anybody seriously think that a Louisiana legislator woke up one day and said, you know, today is going to be the day that the Pelican State is finally free from the scourge of unlicensed florist? No, of course not. It's the same thing in Bradwell. It's existing uh, florists not wanting to compete with newcomers. No doubt about it. But it's a rational basis case. So not only does the government get to say anything that comes to mind that is conceivable, in other words, not clinically insane, the judge actually is supposed to get in the business and help. No kidding. Under rational basis review, judges are specifically instructed by the Supreme Court to assist the government in coming up with justifications for law. Can you imagine, and in fact, let me change it. Please do imagine that you are a young lawyer trying your first case, breach a contract case. Judge calls you the bench first day of trial and says, counsel, I have to tell you something. Not for nothing, but last night I was retained by your opposing counsel for the limited purpose of helping them think of defenses to your breach of contract suit. Now, I'm not going to help them in any other way. Are we ready to proceed? Who wants to be a litigator one day? Raise your hand. Are we ready to proceed in this case? No. No. If you do not move to recuse that judge, you will be committing what? Malpractice. Yes, that's right. Judges are not supposed to help one side win cases. But they do in rational basis cases, and the reason they do is because nobody thinks it's a serious, you know, it's, it's not a standard. It's just it's a game that you play. Uh, and the judge played the game and uh, upheld the law on a couple of different bases. My favorite one was, and I'm sure all of us can guess, public health and safety, but why? Infected dirt, yes. Infected dirt may be the reason why Louisiana passed this law. You can look it up. Um, it's the Meadows v. Odom case. Fortunately, we got it vacated on appeal uh, when Hurricane Katrina mooted the case. But yes, you can look up that district court opinion and see an American district court judge upholding a law partly on the basis of a free-floating concern for infected dirt. Totally fraudulent, totally made up, no doubt whatsoever what's going on, and no more doubt in that case than there was in Bradwell, I would submit. Okay, last case. We represent a bunch of monks, and boy, if you ever get a chance to represent monks in a public interest case, take it. Um, <laughs> bunch of monks, Benedictine monks, again in Louisiana, they make their own wooden caskets at the monastery, and then they sell them um, to help support the monastery. And uh, for those who don't know, a casket is a large box, usually made out of wood, sometimes metal. Okay. In the state of Louisiana, you have to be a state licensed funeral director to sell this box. Does that smell fishy to anybody? What if I told you there are only two other states in the country that enforce such a law? What if I also told you that they use that monopoly to mark up the price of caskets between three to 500%? Starting to get my drift? Okay. So the state argued, well, you know, that actually there are some important reasons why you have to be a state licensed funeral director to sell caskets. And here's the one they actually settled on in trial. We had a day-long trial on this. You'll never get it, so I'm not even going to ask you to guess. Here's what they said. The people of Louisiana are, are fat, basically, some of them. 
real fat. And if you're not a state licensed funeral director, you won't know how to fit somebody into the appropriate casket. You will lack the mental capacity to construct a casket that is large enough for the fat person who has to be. They really said this at trial. Query, is that insane? I mean, it's ludicrous. It's totally disingenuous. It's insincere, fraudulent. But is it insane? Does it fail the rational basis test? And the answer is, who knows? The district court judge looked at the case and said, I don't find that plausible. I also can see exactly what's going on. That's not legitimate. Pretty much did what I suggested at the beginning judges have to do to resolve these cases. And the state was so incensed at this judge actually judging their law sincerely that they have appealed to the Fifth Circuit, and it is an open question what will happen. I will leave you with this. Reasonable people can disagree about everything practically in the Constitution, probably except for we can't have a 34-year-old president. Probably everybody can agree on that. Other than that, it's pretty well up for grabs. What we should not tolerate, must not tolerate, is the kind of dishonesty and insincerity that comes with judicial abdication, with the rational basis test, with not asking why was that law really enacted, and instead just accepting at face value totally insincere explanations of the kind that were offered in Bradwell and the kind that were offered both in the Flores case and the Casca case. And believe me, it's not just occupational licensing. This problem is rampant. Thank you. <coughs> Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, good to be back. Um, I infer from, from the invitation to come again that uh, I was at least tolerable last time. It's, uh, uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, uh, to participate in the excellent programming that the Federal Society here at Duke Law School uh, each year, uh, each year um, uh, provides to the rest of the Duke Law School community. I'm going to sit because I'm in the uh, in the midst of a, an acute back spasm. And so I'm going to access the part of my brain that's not, uh, that's not awash in pain right now and uh, uh, offer you a different perspective on, on judicial engagement. So we have in the United States a social practice, a social practice called constitutional adjudication. Uh, Mr. Neely is a very capable practitioner Right, a very capable participant in this practice of constitutional adjudication. And his call for judicial engagement, I think, is best understood uh, from the perspective of a participant, right? from the internal perspective of someone who's part of the social practice. You could be a public interest lawyer. You could be a judge. Uh, you could be an academic. You can be a law student, all participating in this practice. Uh, and I'm going to have a few things to say about the call for judicial engagement from this internal point of view. Uh, what are we to make of it in jurisprudential terms? But I want to begin uh, from the external point of view, from the external point of view of the analyst of the constitutional system, right? Someone who uh, is not driving the car, but sees the car uh, and opens up the hood and looks at what's going on underneath and how it works in practice, right? And I think it's important to situate this call for judicial engagement in historical terms before, before engaging it internally. Uh, it is, at the very least, striking uh, to hear uh, prominent conservative lawyers, prominent conservative public interest organizations call for judicial engagement in light of the past several decades. Uh, you can start it with conservative opposition to the Warren Court enforcing school desegregation decrees, uh, providing a variety of criminal procedure protections to criminal defendants, enforcing the separation of church and state by, among other things, banning uh, prayer in public schools. Uh, for many decades, what we heard from conservative critics of the court is that we need judicial deference. We need judicial restraint. We, should, uh, we, we don't want government by judiciary. We don't want judges who legislate from the bench. We want judges who understand the difference between judging and legislating. You saw this with President Nixon. You saw this with President Reagan. You saw this with both President Bushes. And at times, you saw this with, with then uh, Senator McCain when he was campaigning for president. Uh, you heard for a very long time a push for greater judicial deference, opposition to judicial activism. And so one question that arises is why now the call for more assertiveness right, by conservatives with respect to what the federal courts, federal judges ought to be doing for a living. 
I can't answer that question with respect to Mr. Neely or the Institute for Justice in particular, uh, but I can observe that this call, um, uh, the call of the Institute for engagement, uh, it, it, it resonates very well with the rise of what scholars have called the new right, uh, the new right in conservative politics, um, and that what we've seen is calls for more assertiveness by judges as the federal courts have become more conservative, right? As more Republicans win presidential elections and appoint more judges to the courts, there's a greater call for judges to start striking stuff down, right? Whereas the problem used to be um, striking stuff down, right now the problem is that judges aren't striking enough stuff down. And you see this um, certainly with respect to economic liberties, economic substantive due process, punitive damage awards, at the takings clause government condemnations, you see it in other areas of constitutional law as well. Affirmative action plans, race conscious student assignment plans, right? um, campaign finance laws, gun control laws, environmental regulations. Right? Conservatives generally today have a pretty extensive list of things, right? whether actions by bureaucrats or otherwise, that they want the courts to invalidate. So I think it's important um, um, uh, to take stock of what's, what's on the table, what's being asked for at this time, and why is it arising now? And would it be arising under other circumstances? Right? If you had courts that continued to be dominated by Democratic appointees, right, would you have this call for greater assertiveness on the part of judges? Now, again, I can't answer that with respect to the Institute for Justice in particular. There have always been libertarians in this country, and I suppose there always will. Right? And they will always call for courts to invalidate economic regulations. Um, nonetheless, um, this, uh, this plea for judicial engagement is part of larger processes of historical change um, and, 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 and uh, really striking differences between what conservatives are asking uh, uh, from the courts now as opposed to um, for many decades uh, from, from, the, from the Warren Court on. So that's what I want to say from the external point of view. It seems to me that this call for judicial engagement um, can be well understood in political terms. Right, and not just in jurisprudential terms. It really depends upon who is on the courts. Um, uh, that's at least a factor in, in, in determining what, what we ask judges to do. But I do want to, I do want to engage uh, the idea from the internal point of view and ask whether there's something useful jurisprudentially going on in this call for engagement. Honest, sincere judging, real judging, not make-believe judging, insincere judging, fraudulent judging. Uh, I applaud Mr. Neely, at least in, in, his, in some of his writings, I believe, if not today, for criticizing this idea of judicial activism. Right? So for a very long time, you heard conservatives, Republicans criticize Democratic liberal judges for being activists. And now you hear, to some extent, Democrats and liberals calling conservative judges activists. And my, my understanding is that the problem, as you see, it is not activism, it's, it's abdication. And uh, so, so, so I would agree, in my own writing, I, I, I've said that activism, um, it's, I think it's, pretty, it's a pretty obvious uh, point. It, it, it's a label that really says, um, uh, I don't like what you just did, right? An activist decision is a decision that I disagree with. A restrained decision is a decision I agree with. And so the criticism of activism is that the packaging is deceptive. It masks substance in process. There are procedural claims about what judges ought to do or not do, when in fact there's a substantive constitutional vision in the background lurking that's not speaking its name, but it's actually doing all the work. Right? Activist judges decide cases in ways that I don't like. Restrained judges don't. And the question I think we should all ask about judicial engagement is whether the same criticism of activism as a label applies to engagement as a label. Is this really a trans-substantive call for judging, real judging, as opposed to uh, fake judging or non-judging? Or in fact, is there a substantive constitutional vision lurking in the background that's talking about judging in a certain way? Right? It's not about real judging versus fake judging, right? but a certain kind of judging, namely judges that vindicate certain substantive values as opposed to others. Uh, I don't hear Mr. Neely calling for engagement when it comes to restrictions on abortion when it comes to discrimination against homosexuals. Uh, maybe he feels that way, I don't know. Um, separation of church and state, symbolic endorsements of religion, lots of government expenditures on religion. 
um, various applications of the death penalty. My colleague Jim Coleman is constantly calling for judicial engagement. Well, he doesn't use the term, right? But he wants judges to look, take seriously various applications of the death penalty. I'm not hearing that here. Um, so it seems to me um, that uh, although, uh, although he says reasonable people can disagree what the Constitution means, but no reasonable person should think that judges should be engaged in faith judging. In fact, I think uh, he's making claims about what the Constitution means and rejecting other claims about what the Constitution means. Uh, and if that's right, then the question is, uh, what is the substantive vision here that's in play, stripped of the deceptive procedural dress about real, honest, insincere? No judge thinks that she's being fake, dishonest, insincere, make-believe. Um, they think they're doing their jobs, right? So stripped of the procedural dress, um, what is the substantive constitutional vision? And I think Mr. Neely has told us, right? It's a, um, um, it starts with L, right? It ends with R. Uh, so what is it? It's Lochner, right? I mean, um, um, that's, that, it seems to me that is um, very much the substantive constitutional vision that's in play. Uh, elsewhere, he's written, um, that the right to earn a living in the occupation of one's choice is among the most fundamental rights that human beings possess. The ability to work and enjoy the fruits of one's own labor is a very antithesis of slavery. Right? Um, the 14th Amendment was specifically designed to protect the right to earn an honest living uh, for all Americans, not just the slaves. Today, that right receives so little protection that courts will accept the flimsy of, of justifications. Right? So it's this idea of economic liberty, this right to earn a living, what the Lochner called freedom of contract, in, but by which it meant also freedom from contract, uh, a real skepticism of infringements of this right in the name of wealth redistribution. Right? The Lochner Court would not have us be at the mercy of legislative majorities because of do-good legislatures that want to redistribute resources from those who have more power and wealth to those who have less. Um, and if that's right, um, if that's the actual substantive constitutional vision here, um, then it seems to me there are a whole, whole host of questions that are in play, and I'll just mention two of them. I mean, first, how much of the constitutional regime in which we've been living since 1937 is unconstitutional? How much of the modern regulatory and administrative state is not just a bad idea and something we should disagree about politically, but is unconstitutional, and judges should be engaged and really, sincerely, honestly strike it down? It seems to me the minimum coverage provision in the Affordable Care Act which the constitutional culture is presently debating, is small potatoes. That's an aspirin in the Hudson. Right? We have some huge wealth redistribution programs in this country. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Does it infringe the right to take someone's money that they've earned right, uh, and force them to contribute to old age retirement, to health care uh, for those who are either elderly or can't afford to take care of it themselves? Does that infringe the right? Right? How much of the, the world in which we're living is unconstitutional? And, and the second question I want to ask um, also draws from history, so I'll end where I started. The last experiment with economic substantive due process did not end well for the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, in fact, it ended very badly. And I think I mentioned last time a famous quote by Alex Bickle. It said that the court um, finally got out of the way and lied down to bleed a while. And if it hadn't, it would have been the end of the story. So to put it concretely, given the vast amount of rent-seeking, of redistribution, of protectionism that routinely goes on in legislatures all around the country, um, do courts have the political legitimacy to police all of it? Um, it's easy to come up with examples right, that are offensive. In fact, we learned these cases in first-year con law. He did, you didn't mention Williamson against Lee Optical. Right? Um, you didn't mention Ferguson against Scrooper. I'm sure you're, you're familiar with these cases. Right? There is something that ought to be offensive, not just to conservatives or libertarians, but progressives, about very powerful people, um, in those cases, doctors and lawyers, right, being able to get the legislature to pass laws that help them when they don't really need all that much help. Um, but it goes on so pervasively. Right? Do the courts have the legitimacy to police it all and strike it down uh, in the way that at least the Lochner Court, to, to, to a significant extent, but, not, but it didn't go all the way. I mean, the Lochner Court made all kinds of distinctions that were vulnerable and tried to put some of the brakes on what, what itself was up to. 
Um, um, could that really go on today? So this may be one way in which Mr. Neely and I disagree. In my own work, I emphasize that uh, right, courts have to take some account of the conditions of their own legitimacy, um, that what they do has to be uh, 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 acceptable, tolerable by other powerful political actors, by the public at large. And with that degree of federal intervention, right, in, uh, with respect to economic and social welfare legislation, be the kind of thing uh, that the courts, uh, could, the, the courts could pull off in a way that would um, uh, allow them to gain the respect that they require uh, in order to have their judgments uh, respected. Thank you both. Um, Professor Siegel, do you want Clark to respond to, to your question to him? Uh, I, I wasn't aware that I don't there was a direct be, question. I don't want to be unfair. <laughs> I, I, he should do whatever he wants. I, I don't Clark, care. Do you want to respond? I, I can do it in like 90 seconds. So okay. I really want to hear your question. So, um, but like on a point of personal privilege, um, I am libertarian. I, I am completely mystified by, by what conservatives are pleased to call their judicial philosophy. I don't get it. Um, I also don't get liberal judicial philosophy either, so I'm mystified by both. But I'm, I'm libertarian. I feel like mine's consistent. I feel like theirs is not. Um, I, you listen, I mean, I, the Insti neither the Institute for Justice nor I are conservative. Anybody who thought that, um, I, I think, would have been corrected by, if nothing else, our filing of an amicus brief in the Lawrence v. Texas case in which we said you do have a constitutional right to do whatever you want with different parts of your body to people of the same sex. I, so we're not conservative, believe me. Um, any, any illusions about that, um, we were thrown out of that club. Um, we didn't really want to be in it, but they made it clear we weren't in that club anymore. So, And I'm happy to be, uh, I'm happy for that to have been clarified, let me put it that way. Um, so, you know, I did not mention um, restrictions on homosexuality or abortion. Um, those are hard questions. Uh, I think abortion, frankly, is the harder one. And uh, look, you can't do justice to either of those questions in 15 minutes. You, and, and all you'll end up doing is either looking stupid or disrespectful or at worst, both. Those are tough questions and they can't be dealt with. Yes, I have views on them. Um, and I hope that you would find my views to be as thoughtful as I hope you found the views I expressed earlier. I don't have knee-jerk views. And that's a really important point. I don't take a position that, well, you know, in any close cases, we should just favor the government. Judges should defer to the government. I don't view the enactment of a law through a democratic, I call it political, you may call it democratic. Once you've been out of law school for a while, you probably call it political. But the enactment of a law through a political process is self-legitimizing. And it doesn't matter whether it's saying to a woman, you can't practice law, or to my client, Sandy Meadows, you can't sell a floral arrangement, or to a person who's gay, you can't do that with that to that guy. Those are all illegitimate laws, not because of some political view that I have, because when you peel back the layers of the onion, if you bother, which judges usually don't in those settings, you find out there's no genuine, sincere justification, but just something like animus, or a desire not to be competed with um, against, I get, what is it now, 60% of women in law school? I mean, you guys are pretty well taken over the profession. Like, that's fine with me, I get that, but that wasn't fine with some people. Um, all right, so point being, all I'm asking for is consistency. I may have my own philosophical and ideological views, but I have tried to put those aside for today and simply say, look, can we all agree that when you go into court, you should get an actual, sincere, committed judge who's not playing for the other team and making up explanations that aren't sincere? I hope the answer is yes. Questions? Uh, so what's like the metric to, to, to judge? Because I mean, if, if, if I think that um, there's a rational basis for child labor, Child labor laws or slaughterhouse cases for not having you know, feces and, and, and drinking water and stuff like that, but other people think that it's a sham legislative purpose. How do we, what's the metric for determining judicial engagement? Good Your question. question. Um, uh, forgive me for getting personal. Do you have kids? No. Okay. Do you, would you like to have kids one day? Yes. All right. If the government came and proposed to sterilize your daughter on the grounds that she was dimwitted, perhaps didn't conform to social mores, um, or even that you know she had a medical condition that would take her life if she got pregnant, what metric would you ask for? I will tell you what metric I would demand. I would demand a metric in which the government offered a sincere justification, was not permitted to simply come in and make up a, a, a demonstrably disingenuous explanation, and was also required to present credible evidence that the concerns they say they have are genuine and that the, the solution that they propose, namely sterilizing my child, will in fact uh, you know, advance those objectives. And that actually is the standard that courts apply in cases involving constitutional values they care about. 
uh, free speech, some kinds of free exercise of religion, etc. Not very many, unfortunately. Not as many as I think there should be. I think any other standard is just not judging. Um, to allow the government to simply come in and say, we have these completely unsubstantiated concerns for which we have no evidence. And by the way, ignore the very real possibility that we're merely trying to suppress competition or you know, engage in eugenics, no matter how obvious the evidence in this case is. Um, so reasonable people can differ about the precise metric. But my position is the metric that has no business in court is one where the government gets to make unsubstantiated assertions and advance demonstrably insincere and disingenuous justifications for its policies. I think both, both with respect to his, his response to me and, and, and the response to the question that, that was put on the table, uh, it, it seems to me there, there's, a, on the one hand, a, uh, an effort to put ideology and substantive views to the side, and on the other hand, a, a slippage in which the ideology and the substantive views come to the fore. So um, when you say, when you peel back the onion, what you see is animus. Well, maybe you see animus, right? Many other people see sincerely held moral beliefs when it comes to, uh, when it comes to homosexuality. When it comes to the standards of review and whether rational basis should, should be the actual purpose or a conceivable legitimate purpose, um, part of that is institutional. Part of that is the legislature often has the resources and the legitimacy to make judgments that courts are not well situated to make. But part of it is very much substantive, right? You said, well, when they care about certain rights, they actually look at the purpose. They don't care about this right. Well, the question is, what kind of rights should courts care about? I don't think everyone, I don't think anyone has the view that no matter what the interests that are at stake, there is the same kind of right, right? People have substantive constitutional visions in which government power may and should not be exercised in a certain way, in which certain kinds of rights are protected and other kinds of rights are not, and the question is which rights. And it, what follows from the substantive constitutional views is what kind of scrutiny attaches to what kind of right and how deferential the scrutiny should be. So it seems to me that you can't just say that um, no matter what your views are about the Constitution, you should engage in sincere, honest judging. Those judges who you think are being insincere or dishonest Right, actually have either different substantive views or enforcing judgments of the Supreme Court that reflects different constitutional views. We have lived in a regime since 1937 that rejects core libertarian claims. They are not part of governing constitutional law. And it's because of that that they, you have the kind of level of scrutiny that we're talking about. No amount of saying, be honest, be sincere, judge, for goodness sake, is going to change that. You need to persuade judges right, that as a matter of substantive constitutional law, they ought to be protecting economic liberty in a way that they used to but don't anymore. Working on it. <laughs> okay. How do you deal with laws that are passed for a variety of different reasons? Is it enough that just one representative gets up on record and says something ridiculous and discriminatory? Or right. is it just that no one could have passed it but for an inappropriate reason? Yeah, great question. I mean, those are hard. It's hard. Um, so conceivably, I'm from Texas, um, and you know, I guess conceivably uh, there was some Texas legislator who actually thought that criminalizing gay sex might have an effect on the AIDS epidemic. I don't think there's any evidence of that. Um, but I would just say, listen, if you think so, prove it. Um, if you're going to claim that that's actually one of the possible justifications for that law, great, let's see some evidence. Um, and if you don't have any, as a judge, believe it or not, I'd actually be fairly restrained. I would just say not. For all time, you can never have this law. I would just say, hey, you know what? Come back when you do have some evidence. Um, you say that the world is going to stop turning on its axis if we allow women to practice law, or uh, Sandy Meadows, my client, Louisiana Flores case, to make floral arrangements. I'm, I'm interested. Yes, show me that evidence. Show me the evidence that you have that this will be a huge problem. If you don't have any, uh, that's OK. Just come back when you do. And so yeah, these are tough questions. But keep in mind, when you're talking about rights that the Supreme Court has deemed fundamental, these are precisely the questions they ask, and the court seems fairly confident that it, it has the institutional capacity to deal with those issues, the fact that multiple legislators may have different motives. But if they're dealing with something like you know, a, a race-based distinction or an infringement on a core free speech issue, they will look at what they consider to be genuine legislative motive, no matter how difficult that might be to discern. All I am asking is that we don't make this, this, this kind of 
inexplicable, at least I think it's inexplicable, discontinuity, where we say, yeah, we're pretty confident of our ability to do that in these cases, and then these other cases, oh, we could never do that. I don't think the Supreme Court has offered uh, a persuasive explanation for that discontinuity in its jurisprudence, and I believe there is none. I think it's pure judicial will. We want to protect these rights in a meaningful way, and we don't want to do anything to protect these rights, and that's how they've achieved that status, or that, that uh, state of affairs, in my view. We've got time for one more question. So just kind of to build off of that one, if you had a case where there is clearly insincere motive and they have that thin overlay, but it is true and there is factual evidence, for example, if in <coughs> Yikwo, sorry, the, um, the vast majority of the wooden laundries were Chinese owned and it wasn't being, it wasn't that the law was being implied unfairly, and that there was that real risk of fire, but that the legislators who opposed it ran on the, we're going to run the Chinese out of town ticket. How do you deal with that situation? <clears throat> um, I would exercise judgment. And I would exercise judgment in a way that is as faithful as possible to the values that I see embodied in the United States Constitution. And I would not disingenuously deny that this document embodies moral values. It absolutely does, and people who pretend as if it do not have already taken the first step in the direction of error. That does not mean you get to just make up any values you want and then impose them on the document, but I believe this document actually stands for discernible values, and I would issue a ruling that was as consistent with my perception of those values as I could, and I would admit that I am fallible, and perhaps I should end on that note. I am fallible. Um, I've been married for seven months. It's, I'm, I'm very aware that I'm fallible. <laughs> Um, but, um, but I would insist, I would insist on, uh, on, on, on intellectual honesty and consistency. And that was what I think, unfortunately, is missing from much of the court's jurisprudence. Well, it, it sounds to me like we're coming towards agreement. I'm going to disagree that the Constitution, best understood given where we are as, as a country at this time, uh, embodies a very modern ideological commitment to economic libertarianism. Uh, but I do want to agree with, with Mr. Neely's suggestion that that uh, the document does embody substantive values, and views about those substantive values are going to determine what kind of scrutiny we apply to different kinds of legislation. Thank you both. Join me in thank you. Thank you. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.